Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm very excited because we have a very special guest today. We have Rebecca Wolf. She is an author, and she's also part of our podcast community, and she also has her own podcast under our channel. She is an amazing individual who just um, has great advice when it comes to parenting, and today she wanted to talk about how do we address dishonesty without punishment? which is a really hot topic because there's a lot of current con controversy with that. And she's going to go over some of the ideas that she has and some of the things that she's experienced and great, give great tips today on how to address dishonesty without punishment. So Rebecca, tell everybody a little about yourself and tell them what you do and, and tell us a little bit about how can we address dishonesty without using punishment with our children? Yeah, thank you so much. And it's great to be here with you today, Stacey. I appreciate you having me on the show and, and running this podcast series. So I have a, uh, I've written a book. It's um, The Gift of a Punishment Free Childhood. And it really chronicles my journey in raising children without punishment. And, you know, I came to the end of that journey and realized one, how effective it is. And two, how much better it makes the parenting experience. And so I have spent the last couple of years really working with parents and helping them see how this, this approach uh, can really serve their families, uh, serve their children and, and help them have, a, have just a, a calmer, more uh, loving, compassionate experience parenting. So uh, one of the areas, though, that I work with parents pretty often is this idea of dishonesty. I think that um, when someone hears that you're going to discipline without punishment, one of the first things they think about is, oh, my gosh, they're going to turn out to be terrible children without any kind of moral compass or, you know, lying, stealing, cheating. And what's interesting is it's actually the opposite that occurs, you know, when we um, parent with the goal in mind of teaching and helping children learn how to live on this planet. Um, it actually builds a stronger relationship with you and the child. They're much less likely to lie or cheat. And yeah. it also instills more of a inner, um, or internal guidance system for them rather than, you know, they, they would choose not to lie because it's the right thing to do versus choose not to lie because they're afraid of getting into trouble. And so it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, a much more stable, better way to support, um, our children in, in stepping into an adult life, um, and, and understanding the consequences of lying and having it be an, an internal, um, guidance to keep them from lying. Yeah, you know, I've seen so much controversy with that. And even in my own family, you hear a lot of the old timers, they're like, well, you know, you have to discipline your child or they're going to just do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And they're going to either they're, they're going to turn out reckless when they grow up. If you don't show them discipline and you don't show them the right way of doing things when they're younger. And then you have the younger generation, our new generation who thinks that way where you don't have to punish your child or yell at your child you can actually talk to your child and you know communicate and get the message across and then you know a lot of times i would see the older generation they would tell these stories about how they were you know pulled by the ear or how they were slapped on the hand and and you know fear was installed in them and that's what made them you know really behave while they were under their parents roof was the fear of actually the consequence that was going to happen after the fact, if they were caught lying and if they were caught being dishonest in some way. And, you know, in this new generation, you know, you that you see kids and sometimes they're doing whatever they want and the parents are trying to control them and trying to get them you know, to understand, don't lie, you know, don't be, misbehave. You know, when I tell you this, you know, you have to do this. And so there is like a lot of different controversy, but maybe you could do a comparison and, and what you've seen when people, when, when mm -hmm. parents are very disciplined and they install fear, or maybe they, you know, they pull on the child's ear and they put them close to their face and they try to install that fear into them, you know, versus when a parent is actually talking to them. Now you mentioned some things just now, but you know, 
a lot of times I would hear a lot of these parents, they're still telling stories, you know, the older generation about what happened. So it seems like it actually had a negative impact. If you still think about these things and you're still thinking about how it made you fearful, well, how did that affect you mentally when you're growing up? Because, you know, if it's still like in, embedded in your head so clearly, I would think that it actually played a role in how you grew up, the trauma, you know, you might not even, they might not even recognize that it, pl it played some trauma in their life, but it, it seems like it did, you know, when you listen to them speak. Right. I agree with that. You know, I think that um, people who were raised with significant punishment, for one, that's what they learned to do, right? They, they, they realize that I can control another person's behavior if I punish them. And so they take that into their adult relationships. Um, when we look at lying in particular, right? Um, it's, as we said earlier, it's a very complex um, topic. And um, when we look at children and lying, we need to make sure that uh, we recognize their developmental stage. Um, when I was doing research for my book, I uh, you know looked at a lot of parenting experts, um, a lot of them in the field of psychology. And what's very interesting about lying is up until about the age of four, children don't understand the concept of lying, right? They have a, they don't have the cognitive ability to if you tell them not to lie, they're not going to understand what you're saying. And they're not, it's just is something that they cannot cognitively grasp. So that was fascinating to me. Right. And so I think the number, number one thing you need to think about with children and lying is to be very aware of those developmental stages. So before the age of four, if a child lies, lies, just have fun with it, right? Just tease them, just say, Hey, that's not something we do. And you know, dismiss it as quickly as possible because they really are not at a stage where they can start to learn about that concept. But what experts have uncovered is that at about that age, around four or five, um, you know, the, the cognitive ability of children tends to advance. There's a light bulb that goes on and they realize that um, what, what mom is experience is different from what I'm experiencing right? Before that, they're like, whatever I know, mom and dad must know, right? It's, it's, it's yeah. very interesting. But around four or five, they're like, wait a minute, she didn't know that what I'm doing in my about what I'm doing in my room or, you know, at my friend's house. And so at that point is when you want to start addressing lying. And I laugh in my book, or joke around in my book and say, the first time your child lies should actually be a celebration because you realize that this is, they've reached that next developmental stage and that they are developing as they should. Um, but of course, you know, we don't want to do that out loud. <laughs> we want to just think about that internally, but as they, as they start to lie, that's when you want to start addressing it and you want to help them learn about it. Um, it's a way it, it is discipline, but it's learning about it rather than being punished for it. Right. I think that's so true. And, and I was actually surprised when you said that they didn't, they don't realize the concept of lie until they're six years old. You know, it's, uh, you know, I never really thought about that, that, you know, that they couldn't really grasp the concept until that age you know, it would, it, to me, it would be something that they would catch on at a very early age. You know, once you tell them they should understand and blah, 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 blah. And, and that's it. You know, now if, if they're, you know, a lot of times, you know, when parents are uh, taking care of their children and they catch them lying, there are there like tips that you should give them, like, you know, how to address it. You know, you said jokingly or be jokingly around. Are there other things that they could do also, you know, just to make sure, you know, uh, to really have that close bond with their child and to and make sure their child understands the concept mm -hmm. of lying and why it's not good and so forth? Absolutely. You know, I think that um, what you want to do again, and, and you've heard me say this uh, before, right, is for the parent to remain calm, right, mm -hmm. to not uh, respond, uh, to know that it's not about you. I think as humans, when people lie to us, we think that they're doing something to us, right? And typically that's not the case. Somebody lies for, and a child is going to lie for all kinds of different reasons, Um so when you catch your child in a lie, the 
what you don't want to do is back them into a corner because then they're just going to lie more, right? You don't want to use those accusatory statements like, did you just lie to me? Well, you know, who wants to answer that question and who <laughs> wants to answer that question honestly? And so certainly when you're working with your children, you want to just state the state the obvious, right? It's like, you know, let's say that, you, you know, you're, you're six year old, you're getting ready to go to a friend's house and you say, hey, you know, I need you to, um, you know, to put all your um, Legos away before we go. Right. And so you, you know, the child comes down and says, OK, I did it. Right. And then you go upstairs and they haven't put the Legos away. So rather than, you know, reprimanding and saying, you're a bad person, you lied to me, right? You go, hey, we talked about putting those blocks away and you didn't put them away. And you told me that that you had. So let's have a conversation about that, right? Yeah. So they they get that sense that, this, that, that it's wrong, but you do it from a, a source of, I just need to explain to you that you this isn't something we do, right? In a relationship, we don't lie to each other. And so- um, you know, have a conversation around, you know, why did you not feel comfortable telling me that you didn't put the Legos away, right? What, what happened here? And so having those conversations, like you said, and, you know, they're going to feel a little guilty, right? That, and especially if you have a strong relationship, right? Now, conversely, if that parent had said, you lied to me and we're not going to your friend's house now, and you're, you know, this is not the kind of behavior that I want out of my, you right, kind of yelling and, and punishing with not going to the friend's house. Not only do they feel bad, but now they feel um, typically like they've been attacked unnecessarily, right? From a child's perspective, especially if, you know, with lying, they do it because, um, they don't know what else to do, right? They don't have the skill set. So in that particular case, they went upstairs, they didn't feel like putting their blocks away. They really wanted to just get to their friend's house. And so the easy, easy out, right, is to just lie. Right. And so having that conversation about, hey, if you don't feel like you have enough time to pick up your Legos, tell me that, right? Tell right. me, you know, let's have that conversation and then we can figure out another strategy. It's a much better way than lying to someone about, not doing something that you said you were going to do. So, and by you remaining calm and loving, they still feel supported and they, they learn from the situation rather than just feeling bad and, and not really learning what to do, right? right? Just what not to do. We need to help our children learn what to do. Right. Now, have you noticed when parents do use discipline and they do put fear into their children and when lying, the outcome as years start to evolve? Now, you mentioned that they might be scared to like be close and bond with their parents, you know, but are there other really, um, you know, consequences that go along if you if you use discipline, if you use fear, if you use punishment, you know, what's going to happen to that child later on? Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question. And, and really you are disciplining even with the strategies that I'm sharing, but what you're doing is you're disciplining without punishment, right? And that's because what punishment does is it, it damages that bond and it sends the message that you have to do the right thing because otherwise you're going to get into trouble, right? right? So they start to be externally motivated, right? Um, and that transfers to lots of different areas in life. You know, it could be grades in school. The only reason I'm going to get a good grade is because my parents are going to pay me or I'm going to, I'm going to get a good grade because otherwise I'll be grounded versus I'm going to get a good grade because I love learning. Right. And I really want to do well in school because I have aspirations to go to college or I have aspirations to start my own business and I'm going to need this information. Right. It's that supporting children in learning how to do the right thing because it's the right thing. Right. <laughs> Not because somebody else is either going to reward me or punish me. That right. external motivation is um, not nearly as effective as that internal and it just supports a better life, right? It supports someone who's engaged, they're 
um, they do the right thing because it feels right. And they, um, you, you know, they just engage with, with other people better. Um, the other thing, and, and this might've been a little drastic, but I would tell my children, I said, when you lie and when you feel bad about what you've done, it actually hurts your heart, right? Or your soul or however you want to say that, you know, what, whatever language works within your family. And that feels a little, a little strong, but it's true, right? When, when we lie or when we're dishonest, we hurt ourselves 10 times more than we hurt that other person, right? And so helping them learn how to kind of be wholehearted and to have that, that healthy heart, this is part of that. And yeah, that, that's the long-term, long-term consequence. I, I think that's so true. You know, when, when you lie to someone and you see that you've hurt that person, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, if that person has a heart themselves and they're, you know, they're going to, they're going to feel bad mm -hmm. that they hurt that person and, you know, not, they may not say it to the person, but I'm sure, you know, any human being, when you hurt somebody and you are, you know, you have any type of love or compassion in, in your heart, you're going to feel the, the, the pain from, the, from what you've done to that other person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, and then the other, other areas that kind of fall under this, right, is thinking about cheating and thinking about stealing, right, those other areas of dishonesty. Um, yes. I think most children have that initial um, experience where they maybe take something from the store, right, they're, they're letting their, their um, desire for candy or gum or a toy override their common sense, which they don't have much of yet. Right. I mean, that's what we have to understand is these children really are learning. They, they, you know, developmentally, it takes time for them to have that, um, that cognitive ability, right. To really understand this. And so most parents will have to address stealing at some point. It's, it's kind of just, again, a natural developmental stage. And yeah. again, you know, making that a learning experience rather than a punishment and, you know, also in a non-punishing way, I think um, having children be able to make it right is also a great way to, to help them learn. So if a child's very young, right, you're just going to, again, you're not going to state, you're just going to state the observation. You're not going to say, did you steal that? Or, you know, you're just going to say, hey, I see that you have some candy. I didn't pay for that. And every time we go to the store, everything we get, we have to pay for, right? right? And so you have that, you explain to them, here's here's why you don't do that because everything, we have to pay for everything, right? And then they're like, they register that. And then, and again, I always want families to feel like they need to do what's right for them, right? Some families, the best thing to do is march you know, the child right back to the grocery store and have a manager. And most managers are very aware of this and right. say, I need you to tell this manager, sorry, and give the candy back, right? Other families may say, we're going to go back to the store and we're going to go to the cashier and we're going to pay for this, right? right? Other families may just say, you know, this was wrong. We're not going to do it again and may just throw the candy away. Again, it, it depends on the family, but helping them see how to not only um, understand that we just don't do this, right? We don't have to make a big, big deal out of it, right? That's just going to make them feel bad. We yes. want them to learn. So you don't make a huge deal out of it. It's very calm. It's very normal, but help them understand what to do and why we do what we do. Um, you know, if a child is older, like, if, or maybe if they've continued to do it. So now we're talking some, you know, we're talking really probably that four or five, six, right? If they're, if they're older, right, then you have them maybe write a letter to the to the manager, right? You make it just a little bit more of a, of a sticking point, make them really think through, write a letter wow. as to as why this was wrong and have them apologize and then make it right. Um, mm -hmm. You also could say, hey, you know, one way to, to learn is to teach. I want you to sit down with your, with your little cousin and explain to them, mentor them on why we don't, why we don't steal. So lots of ways to kind of help a child understand why we don't do this and then to, to make it right. I think, you know, a lot of times too, is just the feeling of, of feeling ashamed. You know, that's like a, 
big thing too. You know, I, I think it's very powerful that that feeling of shame and guilt. And if they're caught and, and you make them write a letter or you make them, you know, acknowledge it, especially to the person that they did it to, that that I think is very powerful, you know, and that I think, you know, is, is even more powerful than than punishing and putting that fear into that person, because now they have to, to acknowledge what they did wrong. They have to acknowledge that they maybe stole something or they took something from the store when they shouldn't have. And they actually have to admit it to the person. And even with adults, that's something it's very hard for, for humans to do is to admit when they have done something wrong, because that feeling of shame or that feeling of guilt is so powerful. Mm -hmm. It is. And, and it's a life skill, right? I'm, you know, we want them with their intimate partners or their colleagues at work or, you know, to be able to admit that they've done something wrong and then to make it right. Right. It's yeah. just, it's a, it's a, again, it's a, it's a life skill that's going to uh, improve the quality of all of their relationships. And also I think helping, you know, because you wouldn't want somebody to carry that shame. Right. right. I think another important message is that everyone makes mistakes. Right. right. When we can, you know, I always tell colleagues or maybe people who work for me, right. Asking for help is a strength, right. Yes. That is not a weakness. And so helping people understand that um, it's okay to ask for help, that we recognize that people make mistakes. And so just owning that mistake and making it right, because then they, they learn that, um, you know, it's okay. And, and then that gives them more compassion for other people as well, right? Knowing that everyone makes mistakes. Yes, because a lot of times there are a lot of people that I, I have come across that feel like they have to be perfect and they have to do everything right. There's no such thing as perfect, you know, but yet they're they're going back. A lot of them I see go back to their trying to please their parents and their parents may not even be alive. They have maybe passed on, but yet in their head, they feel like they hadn't reached that goal, that area where they made their parents happy and they have this thrive, the approval, that self, that, that, that feeling of approval that their parents approve who they did or they, who, you know, who, who they are and they approve what they're doing or they're, they're proud of them. And, you know, instead of being proud of yourself and instead of, um, you know, looking to, to make yourself happy, they're, they're going back and they're trying to live their life, trying to grasp that approval of their parents, you know, and I have seen people do that until their adult years. And, you know, I'm, and it, it, it is from their parents, the way they, their, their parents par parented them, whether they didn't give them enough of praise when they were young, whether they, they, you know, how they punished them and how they, you know, how they treated them when they did things wrong, you know, it played a big role on how they, what, how they grew up and mm -hmm. always looking for that self-approval, that, that approval from their parents, even if their parents weren't here, they would look at the personality and would they be proud of me? you know that's so true and that's that external motivation again right wanting to please other people because typically that carries over into you know relationships with other people and so you find people who want to be people pleasers right yes. and also an, an unhealthy characteristic right being a perfectionist wanting to be a people pleaser right you want um and i think especially uh young women the, often, you know, little girls fall into that. We, they, they get that message that you have to make everybody around you happy. And so you want to ensure that they are doing what they're doing because it's right for them. And it's what, what they want to do and what they feel and to, to, to be proud themselves. Right. Because you're, you're exactly right. You know, not only is punishment can be, um, detrimental, but having a strong reward system can be detrimental as well. External rewards, right? We need our children to grow up and to um, uh, do what they do because they're following their own heart and it's what's right for them, right? Not to please other people, not to avoid punishment, right? Because again, both of those things actually trigger exactly what we're talking about here today, which is lying. Yeah. Right? 
people will, um, you know, we think of lying as such a bad thing, but it's actually so much, so common. And, and it's one of those things we, that really shouldn't, we make too big of a deal of it because it's a very, very common thing. And, and so when, when people back us into a corner, right. Or if people haven't made it safe for us to talk about certain topics, then that's when we justify white lies. Right. Yes. So yeah, it's lying is fascinating. And I, I've seen young children, you know, lie to um, each person differently just because they want to just tell them what they want to hear because they just don't want to be reprimanded or they don't want to be lectured and they don't want to be punished, you know. So they mm-hmm. just basically tell the person what they want them to, you know, what they think they want them, want them to hear. And then that's when the, there is no bond, you know, you're basically, you're just, you're just, you know, filling a relationship. Well, I have to just tell them what they want to hear. You know, I can't really tell them, you know, what I'm really thinking or who I really, you know, want to be and, you know, and what, what, you know, what my goals are, because I know they're not going to agree with them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, this, this leads to all different, you know, other topics we could explore, right. Is how do we ensure that we're not, um, you know, putting our own motivations onto our children, right? Like if we always wanted to be a doctor, well, we're going to push our, our child that direction. And again, right. We're, we're setting them up for failure and we're setting them up to experience, um, having to tell lies or not being their authentic self. So Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And then Absolutely. how do you feel about cheating? You know, when, when children, you know, when they, when they cheat and they, they, they do things like that. And, and in school, I remember, you know, there was they lots of times, especially back in the day, you know, kids would write the answers on the, on the desk and they know they knew who was going to be sitting at the desk the next period. And, you know, and, you know, they would be, some kids would get caught. Some kids wouldn't get caught, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, it would be a way for, you know, to get good grades and, you know, kids did all little things like that. And uh, so when, when kids are caught cheating and they're caught, you know, doing things they're not supposed to be doing, is there a specific way that you suggest that we should handle this? Yeah. You know, I think that with cheating, you, of course you want to address the behavior and explain to, to children that we don't cheat, but typically when a child cheats, there is absolutely that underlying reason, Right. Um, so let's say that you, uh, discover that your child is cheating, playing a game with their friends, right? You don't want to confront them in front of their friends, but you have that conversation afterwards and say, Hey, I saw that you, uh, purposely, um, you know, had a, a, a game card that you kept under the board game that you could slip out and, and cheat with, right? Talk to me about that. And, and they're going to say, you know, I get tired of losing or I always want to win. And so really talking, talking through that and talking about the, the joy of just playing, right? Uh, letting other people win. Um, maybe if it's that upsetting, talking about what kind of games can you play where there aren't losers and winners, Right. Um, definitely in sports, we want to make sure that children understand that, that cheating isn't, isn't the way to win. Um, and you know, in, in those cases too, one thing I do want to mention, and then then we'll talk about school as well, is that sometimes parents set the expectation that the child has to be the best at everything, right? I want you to be the best in the classroom. I want you to be the best on your team. I want you to, right. And I think that that when you set the bar high like that and unreasonable, you're, yeah. you're asking for cheating because that child so wants to do the right thing for you that, that they will cheat rather than not look like they're the best. And so the message we want to send is do your best, right? Right. You, you want to do the best that you can, but you don't have to be the best, right? If just like everybody makes mistakes, no one can be the best at everything. And so yeah. I think parents really need to look at, look at that, um, message that they send. And mm-hmm. then, you know, in the classroom, I think that, um, there's lots of things, you know, I, I think there's a whole nother book about a punishment free classroom or punishment free skill schools. Um, but certainly if, if students feel like they have to cheat, then, 
the, the teacher really needs to look at what's happening, right? Um, right. We know that standardized test, we know that testing is not the best way to learn. And right. I think that, you know, we have been educating people the same way for about 200 years now. And yeah. I think there's an opportunity to, to change that, right? Because yeah. when we test students, all we really learn is who's a good test taker. Yeah. <laughs> we don't yeah. learn about who knows the material, right? Yeah. Yes. And so looking for ways to assess learning that doesn't involve high stakes testing, because what we're really doing is setting those children up to, to cheat. Yes. A hundred percent. And and a lot of people aren't good test takers. A lot mm -hmm. of people are visual learners. You know, you have a, a mixture of all these different types of, of people who, who learn differently. There are people who create outlines and through outlines and organization, they can retain information better. You know, unlike, you know, there's so many different ways that people learn, you know, how to understand a topic and understand, you know, the concept of it differently. And, you know, and some people do not handle pressure well. You know, there are a lot of children who get very stressed out before a test. Uh, my daughter always used to get good grades, but before a test, she would get so stressed out and oh. she would have such a hard time. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, it, it's, it's just, it, it puts a lot of stress and it puts a lot of unnecessary negative emotions because it it's, you're, you're given, you know, well, this is going to be 80% of your grade, or this is going to be this much of your grade, or, you know, as a child, you know, okay, we have a, we have a spelling test on Friday, you know, and that counts as part of your grade, your overall grade. And, and that's, you know, that's very nerve wracking. And then they mm -hmm. have to bring home that grade and get it signed, you know, from their, from their parent. So that's a lot of pressure, you know, and if there's ways that we could teach children and we can make sure that they understand the material, but not put so much pressure and not, you know, not make it so, you know, uh, overbearing for the child, you know, that would be great if they could mm -hmm. figure out different ways, you know, we, we have been doing the same thing over and over and over again, but a lot of the things in the school systems don't work, you know, and I used to get frustrated, you know, because there are, and there are a lot of things that teachers aren't taught that they should be taught because every child is different. Every child thinks differently, acts differently, behaves differently, comes from a different environment. And, you know, a lot of teachers are not, um, they're not taught how to deal with all those different situations. And, you know, what is the ideal punishment when you're in a classroom? You know, what, what, what are they taught on how to make a child behave? You know, there are many times where these children are sent to the principal's office or they're, they're you know, and they're ridicule these children, you know, mm -hmm. because they made them such a big ordeal because they did one thing wrong, you know, and then that child, you know, has this negative, you know, um, uh, moment in it stuck in their head. And, and a lot of times people will bring up, you know, stories of when they were in school and how they got punished in school. And they're, they're in their forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, and they still remember it like it was yesterday. So if it's having such an impact on, on, you know, you know, what, how they punish, you know, how they punish at home, how they punish in schools, you know, can you, you know, they have to really think about this and take this into account and how this, you know, this is actually traumatic. If they, if they can remember this, you know, this is a negative emotion, you know, how did this affect them in their adulthood life? You know, what, what change, you know, what caused them to change? Because when we have traumatic events, we do change as a human, you know, some people will, will get help and they'll be able to go back to where they were, but a lot of people just keep moving and they don't get help. So, you know, we have to think about the overall outcome of how, you know, you know, punishing and, and, and you know, what's the right way to punish and, you know, and if we don't punish the right way, what's going to be the outcome? How are these children going to end up in their adulthood years? Because a lot of, you know, a lot of people, you know, 70% of the, of the United States comes from dysfunctional families. And, you know, and that has to do with, you know, everything, the way you're, you're disciplined, the way you, you grew up in school, you know, and there's, there's all different components to it. So, you know, we really have to really think about, you know, how do we punish a child and appropriately so they can grow up to be productive young children, adults mm -hmm. in, their, in their adult years? Yeah. Well, and, and I'll, you know, correct your language just a little bit, right? There's no correct way to punish, but there is a correct way to discipline, right? Yeah. To really help them see what they did wrong, right? Because any yeah. kind of punishment, you're right, it's going to stick with somebody. And we know that memories are made 
when emotions are high and those yeah. emotions are high in those punishment situations, not because they're saying, oh my gosh, that adult is right. I shouldn't have done that. And I deserve to be punished. Oh no, no. Yeah. Right. What, what they're feeling and why the emotion is so high is they feel terrible. They feel blindsided most of the time. Um, again, most kids don't, um, don't, uh, misbehave on purpose, right? It's because of other reasons. And so they feel unfairly punished typically that, um, power differential feels awful, right? The message is sent that if you're bigger or hold more power, right. Then, then you have that, um, you know, ability to to punish me. I mean, it's a terrible feeling to be punished. Right. And so looking for ways to help them learn with without punishment, right? But to discipline through through teaching, through helping them make things right, like we've been talking about today, right? Yeah. There's just there's there's such a better way to help our children learn. Um, you and I were talking earlier about uh, sometimes we see children misbehave because they want attention, and that feels. Uh, to the parent, sometimes that feels purposeful, like, oh, they're purposefully misbehaving so that I can give them attention. It, it, they're not that smart, right? We're giving them too much credit. If a child is misbehaving because they're not getting enough attention, it's because they're not getting enough attention and their little selves are like, oh my gosh, I need, you know, I need to get my parents' attention. And it's, it's not pre-planned, right? It's not premeditated. It's just what happens when they're feeling that way. So yeah. it's so true. It's mm -hmm. so true. And then even like children, a lot of them just want to, they just want to look cool or be, they want to be liked by the other students, you know? And um, so they'll do things and they'll, they'll be, you know, they might want to be a clown around or they might want to mm -hmm. follow you know, the popular kids um, behavior and, you know, and then to, 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 instead of talking to the child, you know, the, a lot of ch children are punished for their behavior, you know, and, and if we actually, you know, like you mentioned, spoke to them and, and, and actually were able to, you know, put it in a more positive aspect, you know, how we, how we discipline our children, you know, like you said, you will be closer to the child. The child will be more honest with you. The child will be able to confide in you and you, the child will listen to you and use you, use you as their mentor instead of looking at you as their, as a fear factor and, and, and drawn away from you. Yeah. Excellent summary. Now, what would you say if you, if you had to combine everything we talked about today, what would you, what were some things that important factors that you'd like to emphasize to the listeners? So the factors that I would emphasize one is, um, anytime your child misbehaves, but especially if they're lying or cheating to, um, stop before you respond and make sure that you are remaining calm and remembering that it's not about you because, these particular behaviors can be very triggering for an adult. The last thing they want is a child who's, who's lying because we know in our society, right? You can, you can go to jail for that. So um, remembering to not let it trigger you so that you can remain calm. Um, remember that the best way for a, student, for a, a child to learn is through, through teaching, explanation, remembering to tell them what to do in addition to what not to do. And then uh, finally, just remember um, all humans really want to do the right thing. And if we lay that groundwork, that's what's going to happen, right? So you, we need to ensure that parents aren't bringing fear to the situation, right? Like, oh my gosh, my child's going to be a horrible person. Bringing yeah. that mm, faith and um, knowledge that really, if, if children are given the support they need, we're social beings. We want to get along. We want to fit in. And all they need is that little bit of support. 100%. Now, you wrote a book. Can you tell us about the book that you wrote? Sure. So the book is uh, The Gift of a Punishment-Free Childhood. And in addition to sharing stories about my experience raising my children without punishment, um, it, it helps families first understand the why. Why would I do this? 
how is this going to, you know, support my family? And, and in my, my perspective, that the subtitle is a new way to parent for a new world. I really yeah. think that, that this could change, change the world positively. Um, and then lots of information based on the developmental stages of children and wow. then wrapping up with the importance of making sure that parents care for themselves. And then mm-hmm. kind of the, you know, the, the catch as I, as I shared earlier is the gift is actually mm-hmm. as much for the parent as it is yeah. for the child, because it just makes your experience so much more positive. And it was, that was a surprise to me, right? When I set out on this journey to not punish, my goal was just to support the child and and helping them to be a more wholesome adult. And then the surprise was that, wow, this was really a much better experience for me. Yeah, definitely. You know, when you told me about your story and you told me how, you know, in the beginning, you know, everyone thought you were nuts for, for raising children without punishment but then in the end it actually it, it it was such a positive outcome because your children had drawn to you they had they had developed a, a very significant bond with you and you were able to actually get the message across and and you didn't have to use punishment as as a as a as a tool that you were able to discipline them without using punishment and it actually mm-hmm. had a, a huge positive effect on the way your children turned out, which were wonderful, you know, so, and where can people find your book, by the way? So it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble online. So really any place books are sold. And uh, again, you can just look it up under punishment free childhood or my name, Rebecca Wolf. I also have a website. So that's um, Rebecca Wolf, R-E-B-E-C-C-A-W-O-U-L-F e.com. And on that website, I have more information, resources, um, uh, access to these podcasts. So would invite listeners to, to check that out as well. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And, and do you provide any services if someone wants to come to you and speak to you, you know, what type of services do you provide? Sure. I'm always happy to, uh, support parents in, in parenting, um, through one-on-one coaching, uh, virtually, um, there's resources and then I'm also happy to come and talk to, to groups, um, whether that's a group of moms that get together or perhaps, um, folks reading, reading the book, uh, happy to, uh, come and speak as well. I love it. This has been amazing, Rebecca. I, I'm so glad you came on the show today. This is such an important topic because so many, you know, we there's so much controversy because we have an older generation and a younger generation. The younger generation is actually gearing towards being able to discipline their child without punishment. And the older generation is still caught up with the old ways that we grew up in with, you know, like we I was mentioning earlier on, you know, with, you know, putting fear in their child and punishing their child. And, you know, so, when they see the younger generation doing this, they're kind of, you know, kind of, we kind of stunned on how, how they're raising their children and thinking that, you know, this is not right. You're, you're doing it wrong, you know, but not really understanding it. So I think this is really important because I think people have to understand because a lot of times we tend to follow our parents' role on how they raise their children, how they raised us. And sometimes we don't even realize we're doing the same thing, even if they're, if our parents made mistakes. So being able to really understand another way of, you know, disciplining our children and learning how positive it can be in their overall development growing up, you know, is something to really consider. So I'm glad that you wrote the book and I'm glad that you're teaching this to so many people. And I thank you so much for talking about this topic because this is a really important topic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, appreciate being here today. Oh, I appreciate having you. Thank you so much. And you have a great day. You too.